Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Art as Well. Um, my special guest this morning is the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Dahi de Rochta. And I, I, I met uh, the, the Lord Mayor at a reception that I was very kindly invited to by Dara Tracy, who was president of the Dublin Painting and Sketching Club. And it was to celebrate their 150th year. And it was a tremendous event. And it was in the Oak Room in um, the Mansion House. And the Lord Mayor spoke at that. And I was really taken, as were you know, everyone there, by his sheer enthusiasm and knowledge of the artworks um, in the Mansion House. But I did manage to, to, to nab him and have a little word before I left and asked him if he'd be very kind to come on the art as well and talk about these treasures. And they are treasures. And they date back, some of them, 250 years or more. And it's probably something that not many people have actually seen. So I thought this was a unique opportunity uh, to get the inside track on uh, this. And um, so so this is where we are this morning. So I'm really thrilled. And, and thank you very much, Lord Mayor, for being with us. Before I start, I'll give you a little bit of background. He was born in Ballyfermot in July 1987, and he's a Fianna Fáil uh, politician. He graduated with a BA in history from University College Dublin and uh, with a master's in public affairs from DIT. He was first elected to Dublin City Council in 2014 and then re-elected in 2019 for, for the district of Ballyferma Trimna. Uh, he has worked in marketing and communications for over a decade uh, in Bordnemona, permanent TSB and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Centre, which is an interesting one. And we'll talk to him a little bit more about that. So let's go straight over to the mansion house. Tofolt your roth, Ermajan Ardvera, Dahi Droshta. Gurmila Milamagat, Alan. Yeah. Er, do spar, Gurmila Milamagi, Suk Dunkora, Vet Livermajan, August, yeah, Tomic Tanu, Dunkora, sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, delighted to be with everybody here this morning. Really, really looking forward to our discussion um, and having a bit of a, a bit of chat and hopefully a bit of crack. Yeah, thanks very much. And, you know, the funny thing was when, when we were chatting, when we did the filming earlier on uh, to show the works, uh, I said to you, and, you know, you're, you're, it, it'll be grand because we're doing it on Zoom and you can stay at home. And he said, I am home. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And, and not many people get to know that. But, yeah, when you get elected Lord Mayor of Dublin, literally that night you get the keys to the mansion house and it becomes your home for the year. Fantastic. And you're there with your wife. Am I right? I am, yeah. Amy's upstairs at the moment. So, yeah, yeah it's just the two of us. So, Fantastic. enjoying life, enjoying life. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, before we get into the art part of it, and, and you have a couple of months to go in, in, in office, um, can I ask you, what sort of objectives did you have going into the position? And what were the sort of highs and lows uh, of your term in office that you can recall? OK, so my objective was very, very simple. When I got elected last June, um, I said about making a more inclusive city and a kinder city. Um, so they were the two things that we've looked to do all year. So in terms of kindness, look, I've just finished a whirlwind week of being around 40 schools, just talking to kids about just being nicer to one another, saying how kindness is action orientated. You can't be kind sitting on your couch. It's getting up and it's doing something for somebody. Um, and yeah, just trying to get that message of just being nicer to one another. And then in terms of inclusion, working very, very hard to say, we, we talk about Dublin or Dubliners as, as a place, whereas I'm more focused on a community. So like just before Christmas, we announced that Dublin's going to be the first capital city in the world to be designated autism friendly through a three year plan. Um, as Lord Mayor, I got to make the Paddy's Day Parade go quiet. So half a million people on our streets, biggest parade ever with 4,200 people in it. But we put a relaxed area right in the middle of College Green there as people were coming around. By, That's uh, right. Yeah, I remember hearing that. Yeah, very interesting. Um, and so, yeah, make it, I'm the Lord Mayor who made the parade go silent. All those lovely bands, just so those who are neurodiverse got a chance to come in. And we had about a thousand families that got, got a chance to come in and visit the parade for the first time. And hmm. But yeah, mainly inclusion and kindness, Alan. That's what we've been looking to do all year. And were there any lows? Were there any things that disappointed you during the... Well, absolutely. Um, I think everybody saw on the 20... 3rd of November, three young kids um, were attacked on the streets of our city and their carer. Um, and then to see the scenes that then happened that evening on the, on the Thursday evening, that was a massive low. Uh, I think we saw the worst of our city that night. Mm -hmm. But I thought in the weeks that followed, we really did see the best of our city also. So 
Like, I, I couldn't get my head around the fact that, you know, first responders from the point of view of Dublin Fire Brigade who were on scene within two and a half minutes rendering life-saving assistance to, 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 to those kids mm. were the same first responders that got attacked and got their windows smashed as they were trying to aid some Gardaí who were near burning vehicles. So that was definitely a low. Um, in terms of highs, well, working through my programme, what I've done, um, last September I got a chance to speak at the United Nations. So that was pretty, pretty cool um, as part of UN General Assembly Week. And speaking about culture and the importance of culture in terms of underwriting the 17 SDGs. So yes. there's some highs. Very good. Now, just going back to something I mentioned earlier about, about your career, um, you, you, we mentioned the University of Pittsburgh. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? Because that's not what I expected to see in your CV. <laughs> so UPMC, um, it's a $26 billion US academic healthcare system. Um, so I think about 50 odd hospitals worldwide, about 90,000 employees. And here in Ireland, we have the likes of Santry Sports Clinic, um, UPMC Whitfield, Odd Even, uh, Clane. So we have four hospitals, two cancer centers, and as of yesterday, six sports medicine clinics. Wow. Wow. So you're involved in that in communications and, and that's such. it. So I'm the director of marketing and communications mm -hmm. in Ireland. Brilliant. Well, that sounds fantastic. But you are based in Ireland. You don't or do you, do you have to go to the States much at all? I go to the States a bit and I go to Italy a bit and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, mainly based. So they very kindly given me a sabbatical to go off and be Lord Mayor for a year. So that that's really kind of them. Excellent. And I hope you get a bit of a rest before you go back. <laughs> huh? I, I intend to take July off and then hopefully August won't be too manic. Great. OK. So, Lord Mayor, can you set the scene in terms of the art that we're going to see? You know, what's the history behind the Mansion House, for instance? So the Mansion House is, first of all, for people who are on here, it's the oldest mayoral residence in the world. Is so it, it is. Really? Yeah, oh it was built in 1710. It's also Dublin's oldest freestanding building. Um, it was built in 1710. And it was built by a guy called Joshua Dawson. So Dawson Street, where the Mansion House sits. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, Lord Mayors were, were kind of floating around the city, going hosting um, various engagements in different townhouses. Uh, one Lord Mayor was actually in Stephen's Green under a canopy that they kind of erected with sticks and things. So the city kind of said, maybe it's about time we buy a residence for the Lord Mayor of Dublin to, to be the ambassador. So they, they approached Joshua Dawson and yeah, they spent three and a half thousand pounds and six pounds of unrefined sugar every year thereafter, um, which we don't pay anymore. But that's the mansion house. And I suppose, look, there's three things that the Lord Mayor of Dublin are known, is known for. You're known for the mansion house. You're known for the car. So it's always a black Volvo with the registration number one for, for a citizen. And then obviously the chain of office that you wear, which goes back to 1698. And then the house itself. Um, and we're going to talk through some of the art and, and, and how we go and what we do. But the house itself, there's kind of three themes that run through the house. So with the colonial piece, obviously, when Ireland was under England and we've got the Lord Lieutenants that we're going to talk about, which were the King's representatives in Ireland. Um, the Act of Union pays um, really big significance in, in the Mansion House. So obviously in 1800, um, Parliament voted itself out of existence in College Green to move to Westminster. And then the third theme would be... Um, independence so um the first doll the second doll and the third doll took place here in the mansion house and we can chat through some of that as, as we go through but they're just to kind of set the scene a little bit as you're looking through some of the art as we go on a bit of a journey you'll find some things are very much colonial some things are very much active union and then there's obviously that big heavy ind independence piece yes okay so what we did is Tr trina and myself did a bit of filming uh, a week ago uh, just so we'd be able to look at those without moving a camera around with you, which would have been a bit awkward if we'd done it live. But we are live anyway, chatting about it. So this is the film we did, and we just showed in parts um, to so, so, so that you can talk through each individual one. So this is us arriving uh, at the Mansion House, Tina and myself, together with cameras. And of course, I'm stupidly knocking the door. No one hears me. Should have rung the bell. And eventually. Hello, how are you? Hi, how are you, Richard? Richard lets us in. Uh, just a sweep around there before we say hello to the Lord Mayor. And there's Trina coming up the aisle. Right. 
So the first person we're going to be talking about is Daniel O'Connell. So Lord Mayor, if you'd like to talk through that. So Daniel O'Connell was um, the first Catholic Lord Mayor of, of Dublin. Um, he, he was the Lord Mayor in 1841. And Daniel lived in, in the mansion house. His bed, he still has a four-poster bed, which is upstairs in the mansion house. But don't worry, we've changed the sheets and we've changed the mattress. <laughs> um, but I suppose, like the liberator, the great emancipator, Daniel O'Connell like, had two big things, which was Catholic emancipation and repeal of the Act of Union. And... Like he really did, like um, he secured Catholic emancipation in 1829, but repeal obviously was a much more difficult target. Um, and some connections. So, although he's a Kerry man, um, his first ever public speech was at what was called the Royal Exchange, which is now City Hall, Dublin City Hall, where obviously the council meeting, and that was to protest against the Act of Union. And he joined that campaign. And, and this portrait that we're looking at uh, by, by John Gubbins. It's that idea of his place in the repeal movement during this period. So he's captured young. They say it's in the prime of his life. And, you know, his gaze or he's looking away into the future is what they kind of tell us in terms of um, where he was and what he was doing. And in his hand, you can see in his hand, what they say there is he's um, he's holding signatures. So a petition to demand repeal. Mm -hmm. So, um that's the whole idea, Daniel O'Connell, like such a big, big name, as I said. And he was also the first Lord Mayor that was elected in a way that we know today, kind of through franchise, through Dublin Corporation at the time. So previously it was part of the guilds and, and it was assigned and you worked your way up. You were city treasurer or sheriff and things like that. However, O'Connell came in and he was elected by the council to be the Lord Mayor of Dublin. And Daniel O'Connell. Yeah, and he, and he sort, he's, yeah he sort of dominates the hall, doesn't he? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then just for, for, for some of the guys, you might notice the staffs that go around the picture there. So yeah. at the time, the Lord Mayor was the, they presided over the debtor's court or the court of conscience at the time. So mm -hmm. the Lord Mayor was the magistrate that walked in and the likes of those were carried in front of Daniel O'Connell as they'd walk into court and, they, and, and they'd preside over different things and stuff like that. So it really does. It's a big imposing picture in the hall. The hall is, um, as I said, it's um, still original going back to 1710. There's a fireplace just below that's Kilkenny marble. And yeah, it's it's a, such a lovely piece to walk in, but I suppose it really recognises that role of, like Daniel O'Connell was such a massive um, political figure. Like he regularly spoke to 100, 150,000 people. He once did 500,000 people on the Hill of Tara in terms of meetings. Yeah. Uh, people coming out, listening to him, to talk to him. As I said, as we talked about, um, Catholic emancipation and, and obviously repeal of the union. And again, it's that theme again, repeal of the union. George Townsend. So George Townsend. Um, so this is in the drawing room of the mansion house and it's really, really lovely. Um, and you can see us, we're kind of walking through. Um, so there's three big imposing portraits on, on the wall. What we say about um, George Townsend, well, there's a couple of different things. Um, his portrait was given to Dublin by a guy called Sir John Francis Craddock. And it was given with two portraits. He also gave the Duke of Bedford um, and because they were both Lord Lieutenants and they were presented kind of as a gesture of thanks um, from Craddock because he was admitted to the freedom of Dublin in, in 1801. Um, so he was admitted to the freedom of Dublin. He was a professional soldier and he, is, he assisted in the suppression of the 1798 rebellion. He fought at Vinegar Hill. He fought against um, the French General Humbert, so in Ballina Hinge. So Craddock was honored with this. So he presented these um, to the city. Um, and what we say very much about Viking Townsend is he, um, if you look in his hand, I suppose, and I'll get onto the carpet now as a second, mm -hmm. but when we move, Actually, do you know what? Let's talk about the carpet. So um, <laughs> back about 40, 50 years ago, they were redoing the carpet in the drawing room of the mansion house. And for inspiration, they looked at this piece of uh, Viscount Townsend. And if you look at the carpet that's in, 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 the, um, in the painting, they replicated the carpet and they made the carpet to match the painting, which was kind of really, really cool. Um, as we look at this here now, you can see with Viscount Townsend, he's holding a piece of paper in his hand. So we all know parliaments have term limits. Um, the doll has to go to the people every five years. Uh, Westminster has an election every five years, etc., etc. Well, back in the 1700s, parliaments didn't have term limits. So they could run on and on and on. 
um, and, and they'd run for decades, etc. However, Viscount Townsend, the reason he's on the wall is because of that pe piece of paper he's holding. He brought in what was known as the Octennial Act. And essentially, that meant at a bare minimum, Parliament had to go to, to, to the people or hold an election every eight years. So that came from Viscount Townsend. And obviously, Townsend Street in Dublin is named yes. after him. Yes. Yeah, we can have a little look at, at the Earl of Northumberland here. Um, so a couple of different things about this, okay? So the Earl of Northumberland himself, he he kind of, he was dismissed as the Lord Lieutenant or, or the King's representative because he took part in, in they tried to oust the, uh, the Prime Minister. So they tried to get, get rid of George Grenville because he was good friends with a guy called William Pitt. Um, and so he kind of ended in a bit of disgrace. Um, but you know, what he did was he started working with the city of Dublin and, and um, before leaving office, um, at the request of the Commons of Dublin, he, he presented some stuff to the rectory of, of, of Killscare in Mead. And essentially what this, he was kind of hoping, oh, look, I am a nice guy. I'm all about the trade and welfare of Dublin. We're all good, etc. So essentially then Dublin City turned around and they sent directions to Joshua Reynolds. Um, to obtain Northumberland's full uh, length portrait. So that's the most important reason that's the, there. Um, so Joshua Reynolds, as, as I'm sure many of you guys here would know, he was the preeminent guy in, in the 1700s. He was the founder of the Royal Academy. He was the president of the Royal Academy for an awful lot of his life. Um, so Northumberland sat to Reynolds and when it was finished, although the, the city had awarded this portrait, um, the Duke ended up paying for it himself. But as I said, it's it's yeah. not that we're we're commemorating the Earl of Northumberland here. It's very much that this is a Joshua Reynolds painting that hangs yeah. in the Mansion House, which is really really important and and extremely valuable. Can you tell us how much it was paid or was it cost in the day? So it cost about one hundred and forty seven pounds in the day for yeah. for for Reynolds to do this. And and the way Reynolds would have worked at the time was, um, some of the guys working under him would have done most of the body work Reynolds would have done an awful lot around the face and the features and things like mm. that. But yeah, like this talk. And as I said, what we're going to do, I'm no expert, but I'll give you the stories and what we get yeah. told. Um, there's a value of this of about 10 million euros, they say. So amazing. And it's, it's probably one of the oldest paintings, 1766. It was, it was painted by Reynolds, um, which makes it over 250 years. Yeah. It probably is the oldest, is it? I think there's a Nathaniel Pearson, which is probably oh. a little bit older. All right, okay. Which was done in around 1730, which we'll probably get on to later on. Sure, yeah, okay. Now, another man that the stream is, uh, street was named after. That's it. So Westmoreland Street is named after this guy. John F Fane is, is, is his name. And John was the Earl of Westmoreland. So Westmoreland Street's where uh, that came. He became the Earl at the age of 15. And again, he, he was literally from his teenage years, himself and William Pitt were best mates. And obviously that's how he became to be the Lord Lieutenant um, of Ireland in 1790, because uh, it was William Pitt's influence that able, able to do this. Um, initially, the Dublin City Assembly or the corporation, they didn't really give him the freedom of the city and they wanted to wait out to see how he'd kind of feel and, and how he'd do. Um, but what he distinguished himself was he was a patron of architecture. And as I said, Westmoreland Street's named after him. And Sarah Bridge, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Island Bridge, um, but Sarah Bridge and Sarah Place down there is named after his countess. Uh, and they laid the foundation stone in there in 1791. And probably the only other thing I'd say about this is he was known as the best looking man in Ireland in 1790. Now, he doesn't quite do it for me, but whatever you're into yourself. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. He's a fine looking fella. So now we go up the stairs. We do. A so, paint, uh, a stained glass window here. That's it. So this is this is my favourite piece of the mansion house, hands down. Like on mornings like this morning when it's sunny out there, yeah. like the light just comes in and it just bursts through this. Um, this is what we call the peace window. Now, we don't know why we call it the Peace Window, because what happened was this was commissioned in uh, 1900, OK? Mm -hmm. And what it is, it's it's dedicated to home rule. So if you have to remember, in 1900, um, 
Parliament Act and Balfour Act and all this kind of stuff, the House of Lords now couldn't refuse home rule. So we believed home rule was on the way. They could only refuse it three times and it would have to pass on the fourth time. So this window was done, um, which is absolutely stunning and gorgeous and beautiful. And um, as you'll have a look as we go through it here, um, most people have heard of Harry Clark, a very, very famous stained glass window maker. But on the bottom here, it says Jay Clark and Sons, Joshua Clark and Sons. This was Harry's father that, that put together this window. Um, you'll see some of the names. There's the names like Foley, Burke, O'Connell, all big prominent home rulers at the time. Um, and there you can see like some of the colours and it lights up the, the, the stairway really, really lovely. It has the four um, provinces on it. So you've Leinster, Ulster, Munster and Connacht. But then the middle is the Lord Mayor's crest, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can see the Lord Mayor's crest is the Dublin city crest with, with three castles burning yeah. there. You have Liberty and Justice side or side. And underneath it says, Obediensa Civum Urbis Felicitas, which is, it's the city motto. And normally I'd say to people, who can tell me what it is? But essentially what it means is um, the obedience of its citizens creates a happy city. So put up and shut up. Um, but that's our official um, city motto. And then yeah. underneath you can see, and we'll talk to this probably in a, a portrait of Richard Manders later, but you can see the, the civic sword and you can see the mace. So yeah. the sword itself was a gift of Henry IV to the city. It was, it was struck in 1390 and it was given to the city in either 1409 or 1410. We're not quite sure, but we do know it was blooded before it was given to the city as the civic sword, which means it had chopped somebody's head off. Charming. There you go. Charming. Okay. <laughs> now, King George the Fourth. King George the Fourth. That's himself. So George the Fourth was, how do we put it? He was probably known for being. He came to the throne and he was Prince Regent for years. He came to the throne in 1820, and he was really un unpopular in Britain. Let's call a spade a spade because he led a really scandalous life so he had expensive habits public repudiation of his wife caroline of brunswick he was known for three things he was known for drink women and food and probably in that order the story goes um he he decided as i said he was really warmly received in dublin because a couple of years previously he gave two thousand pounds to the poor of the city in the hard winter of 1816 so upon um acceding to the throne in 1820 it was yes let's um let's make a visit to dublin and mainly because dublin was the only place that supported him when he started his divorce proceedings against his wife um and dublin assured them like we said yeah we'll support you 100 percent. so what happened was the lord mayor and the deputation went over to him invited him to dublin and he said yes i'll come and um, in 1821 he came to dublin he was to come in at um, well, what was known as Kingstown, which is Dunleary now. And there was tens of thousands of people waiting for him. But they drank a bottle of whiskey and they came into North Wall a day early, etc. He was also having um, an affair with, we all know, um, Slane Castle, the uh, Mount Charles's. So yep. Lord and La Lady Mount Charles, he was having an affair with Lady Mount Charles. And Lord Mount Charles thought this was great and was going around Dublin talking about it. And um, for his visit in 1821, the city said, we're going to need to do something. So we built what was known as the historic round room. I don't know if many people know the round room at the mansion house, but that was built for the visit of George IV. Um, it was built in six weeks and they know Dublin Corporation didn't build it because it was built in six weeks. So essentially what happened was they built this gorgeous, it's the round room and it's built on, on the idea of an Arabian palace and that's where he came and it's the same room then that we subsequently had our first doll in but it was built for the visit of george the fourth and as was tradition so george the fourth kind of um he had a painter in chief sir thomas lawrence so sir thomas lawrence took over from george the third when joshua reynolds died sir thomas lawrence kind of became the portrait artist in chief for the monarch so he used to paint these portraits and as i said this was one that he did of George the fourth and so the story goes there was a couple of different types he did one that was very similar for his um his coronation mm -hmm. and obviously that went down so it, it hung in St James's Palace for the for the coronation 
the Queen had um, her Annus Horribilis in the early 90s. Yes. And one of the, the portraits that got damaged in... Um, so we had this portrait. He gave this to, to the city in 1821. And to be quite honest, it stayed in the basement of the mansion house. It wasn't displayed or anything like that. It kind of just stayed downstairs. The mm. Queen had her Annus Horribilis. An awful lot of art was lost. One of them is uh, the, the painting of the coronation by Sir Thomas Lawrence. Very, very similar to this, but different regalia and different robes. Mm. Um, it got damaged. So we gave some eagle eye in the mansion house in the early 90s went, we have a portrait that's very, very similar to that one that's after been smoke damaged. So we gave a lend of our portrait um, over to um, Her Majesty. Um, and for a couple of years, they were able to restore their version of their George IV. And then in 1995, which we go on to, um, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, came to the mansion house and unveiled this portrait on the steps of, um, on the staircase of the mansion house, hmm. where it's hung every, ever since. And for something that languished in, in the basement for the guts of 150, 170 years, it's worth between 14 and 17 million euros. Now, um, isn't there a story about about they they did some conservative conservation work on it and something to do with the the uh, frame? Well, so there is there's yeah. lots of stuff around the frames. What I'd mainly say we're looking at the frame here, and you can see some dust. So because of an awful lot of the art that exists in the mansion house, um, we're not allowed to clean them or touch them or anything like that. So we have to wait for city archivists or the city um, to come in. And they're the guys that are in charge of looking after the portraits and including mm. even just dusting them. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see there, there's a bit of a build up. OK, now then we go on to talk about Alfred Byrne. So Alfie Byrne, very, very quickly, um, and we'll have a look at this. Alfie Byrne was the longest serving Lord Mayor of Dublin. He did nine years in a row. And then subsequently did another two years after that. So he was Lord Mayor from 1930 to 39. And then in 52 and 53, he was the Lord Mayor of Dublin. He was known as the shaking hand of Dublin. So he used to go around and uh, he always had chocolates in his hand or he always had some more coins like chutney bits and hate me bits. And he'd give it to the kids and he'd say, uh, tell your ma Alfie Byrne gave you that. And he used to go around the city doing these kind of things. But... Uh, yeah, longest serving Lord Mayor, as I said, 11 terms, all in all, nine in a row, and then a, a subsequent two. Yeah. Right, Richard Manders. So we go into the Oak Room now, okay? And mm -hmm. the Oak Room is very much, it's a tribute to the Act of Union. There's three big portraits that we're going to discuss now in a second. There's Richard Manders, you've got Speaker John Foster, and you've Charles Stuart Parnell. So this is the Oak Room of the Mansion House. This was the room that was built when jo uh, when they were buying the house off Joshua Dawson and Dawson said he'd build a house for, um, or he'd build a room for the Lord Mayor to host people. And as I said, this is really, as a, the big, big, three big pieces of um, art all relate to the Act of Union. So the Act of Union in 1800, Ireland voted, as I said already, to dissolve their parliament at College Green and move to Westminster. And it was very much like the Brexit of the day. So it was really divisive. Um, it was in response to the 1798 rebellion, but there was an awful lot of bribery to get people to vote to do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Richard Manders was the Lord Mayor of Dublin at the time, and he had to work very, very hard to bring the city together. So the people of Dublin awarded him a portrait. He was the Lord Mayor at the time and really... He was the Lord Mayor of a very, very divisive city in 1801. So he came together and you can yeah. see his right hand is just on that sword that I said before, which is the yes. civic sword. He's also wearing the chain of office. And I might just have a quick chat with that if it's OK, Alan. And give mm, some sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the Lord Mayor of Dublin is known for the chain of office that they wear. Um, the chain, to give you all a bit of a history lesson here, um, forgive me if I'm going too much into it. But the Battle of the Boyne happened. King James II was the Catholic monarch of England. And in 1690, he had a falling out with his son-in-law, a guy called William, who came from the Netherlands. And they ended up, they had a battle on the Mead side of the Boyne River, just across from Drogheda. And the king lost. So the king, his supporters, the Jacobites, including the Lord Mayor of Dublin, fled to France. And the Lord Mayor brought the previous chain that was given by Charles II 
and it was never seen again. It's believed he melted it down and he lived off it for the rest of his life. And in 1698, it's like, hey, I'm the Lord Mayor of Dublin and I don't have a chain. What am I going to do? Yeah. So they petitioned the new king, William III, um, and he gave £1,000 in 1698 for a chain for the Lord Mayor of Dublin, which is the chain that we still wear today. Um, it's worth over €4 million. Euros. Yeah. Um, yeah. We do have, so it's 24 karat gold. We do have a direct replica, which is nine karat gold. And that's my walking around chain. That's only worth about 250,000 euros. So not quite the four million that you think it is. But um, yeah. it's just while well, Richard Manders, and you'll see on some of the other portraits as well, some of the Lord Mayors um, are wearing the chain. And we'll get on to Kathleen Clark in a while and we can have some chats about her and not yeah. wearing the chain. Yeah. Okay. And John, John Foster. Foster. So John Foster was the Speaker of the House of Commons. Um, he was the Speaker of the House of Commons and argued vociferously against the dissolution of Parliament. He really, really wasn't for this whatsoever. He thought it was a bad idea that Ireland should not be voting their, their, their Parliament out of existence. Um, he came from Loud and um, you know, subsequently he went on to Westminster and things like this. But he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Then he became the House of Co the leader of the House of Commons. And, you know, following, like when they decided to, as I said, abolish Parliament in Ireland, he was the head of that widespread opposition to the proposal. But obviously it was in vain. Uh, the Act of Union was passed and he presided over the last session of the Irish House of Commons um, in August 1800. Um, he wouldn't give back his speaker's mate. He refused to do it. And he gave it to his own descendants for years and years and years. And if anybody's been to um, the old Parliament House or the House of Lords in College Green, it's actually on display there in Bank of Ireland. So he was one of those few, afterwards then, one of the few anti-unionists to then get elected to Westminster, where he taught. But yeah, so what it was, because of his opposition and leading the opposition, the people of Dublin awarded him um, that portrait that's in the Mansion House. No, Charles Stuart Parnell. Charles Stuart Parnell. So Parnell's there, or if anybody was under Michael Laffin in UCD, it's Charles Stuart Parnell. Um, but we all say Parnell. But apparently that's how Parnell uh, used to say it was himself. And this piece here now, when we're, when we're talking about Charles, he was the uncrowned king of Ireland. Like he, he was the leader of the Home Rule Party. He like the, the Home Rule Party was the first time there was a formal political party put together. Um, and they were obviously over in Westminster and they were advocating a lot for, um, yeah, for the for a parliament for home rule. So parliament to come back here and, and, and to be able to do it. He was, you know, he was really, he used Dublin City Council as a vehicle to kind of promote the cause of home rule for, um, for Ireland in the absence of an Irish parliament. And he, he was always encouraging to create that power base piece, you know, get election, win election, come together. Um, and to be able to do that. So Parnell supporters were, the Lord Mayor were all, so for the 18, 1882 to 1889, they literally, there was a monopoly in the office of the Lord Mayor by Parnell supporters. Um, and Dublin City Hall, where we have, that rotunda was the venue for big, important meetings. And it's also where Parnell's funeral took place in October 91. Um, and this portrait here that we're looking to do, so it's Thomas Alfred Jones. Um, it was a posthumous por portrait done. And that's why it's it's that idea to a lost leader. So it's really dark in what it is. He's depicted at sunset. You've got the ruined abbey and twisted gravestones in the background. It's Celtic cross. And there's a real sense of bereavement and mourning. Um, and that's, you know, that's the feeling that, that gets done of Parnell. So... It was done after his death and you can see by the darkness in terms of how it is, how people felt the city was. And and, and that hangs, it hangs pride of place in the Oak Room at the moment. Um, and it will forevermore, as I said, because of where it is. Yeah. And we'll see that now where the second doll took place. So this is it. So as I said already at the start of this, in 19, so we had the Easter Rising in, in 1916, a military failure by all accounts. Mm -hmm. But they had this idea of the blood sacrifice when leaders were executed, likes of James Connolly, uh, public mindset shifted a little bit. That led then to elections in 1918. The next parliament elections were December 1918. And essentially what happened was Sinn Féin 
well, what, old Sinn Féin, they got, I think, 74 MPs who all decided if they got elected, they were going to start a parliament in Dublin. So what happened was then on the 21st of January 1919, the Mansion House played host to the first doll. However, the reason that this is a picture of the second doll is because for the first doll, there was only 27 TDs there because the rest were all locked up. Uh, they were arrested. They were over in England. They were over in Wales. So this is a picture of the second doll. Oh, McNeil there is in the chair as um, Keown Corlett. If you look just with the head bent, it's Michael Collins. Just to the left of Michael Collins um, is Arthur Griffith. To the left, kind of holding, um, writing on a pad is Eamon de Valera. And as you pan around, there's some other, um, you've Roger Casement there. You've got Constance Markovich there. Liam Cosgrave is on the end. He was the first president of the executive council. Some people call him the first Taoiseach, but we didn't actually formally have the role of Taoiseach until 1937. And then I don't know, will this zoom out a little bit, Alan? Because yeah, as we come up there, there's that Thomas Alfred Jones picture. Uh, the quality is not great on that. Just um, here. Yeah. But that's Charles Stewart Parnell looking over uh, everything um, in, in the proceedings of the first, the second, and the third doll. So, um, Kathleen just, Clark. Yes. Kathleen Clark was the first female Lord Mayor of Dublin. And she served two terms. She, she first got elected in 1939, so straight after Alfie Byrne. It was actually a toy, and Alfie was happy to let her become the Lord Mayor. Um, first female Lord Mayor of Dublin. You'll notice she's not wearing the chain that every other Lord Mayor has wore. Um, Kathleen Clark was a staunch Republican. She was the widow of Thomas Clark, Thomas J. Clark, who was a signatory of the proclamation. And she was a staunch Republican. There was portraits and art of Queen Victoria that her and her sons just threw out onto the courtyard and everything. Just get it out of the house. We don't need this royal stuff in the house whatsoever. Um, but yeah, she refused. So she's wearing the chain of the court of conscience or that debtor's court that I spoke about previously. That mm -hmm. was the chain she, she chose to wear um, instead. She's the only person that's refused to wear the chain of office. And she refused to wear it because on the sovereign or on the medal of the Lord Mayor of Dublin is King Billy, William of Orange, William the Third. Um, so that didn't um that didn't go well with, with Kathleen Clark's beliefs. No, I can imagine. Right, Michael Staunton. So there's two paintings that we're going to talk to here. So Michael Staunton was the Lord Mayor in 1847. So for history nerds like myself, that was known as Black 47. Obviously, in the famine, we lost two and a half million people for either death or emigration. Uh, Michael Staunton was the Lord Mayor of Dublin, as I said, in 1847. And like all good nobles, as soon as he finished, he fled to Australia. He got the hell out of Dublin. Yeah. So when they went to, they went there and we're going to see another painting. We might continue this story, Alan, in a few minutes when we yes. look at his wife. How does that sound? Yeah, no problem. So Nathaniel, Nathaniel Pearson, um, Lord Mayor Dublin, 1730, 1731, a Tipperary man. And again, one of these, um, he served as sheriff, as treasurer. He was an MP. Um, for those who are familiar with Dublin, his family seat was in Moyle Park in Clondalkin. Um, and essentially what happened was, this I believe is one of the earliest paintings in the mansion house. But it's certainly the first display of a Lord Mayor with the city insignia and the regalia. So you can see, not alone is he wearing the Lord Mayor's chain there with the thing, you can see the chain of the court of conscience is underneath. Um, there's yeah. the sword in the background, etc. So this was the first time that we kind of saw um, a Lord Mayor being painted with all the city regalia and all the insignia and things like this. Uh, they bounce around. They're not really sure who, who painted this, but they've kind of settled on uh, Charles Gervais and then we get on to George Villiers. Yes. So uh, so this is George Villiers, again, a massively huge painting in, in the mansion house. So this has been in the Civic Collection for over 200 years. But for most of that time, um, it was wrongly attributed as both the artist and the sitter. So for a yeah. good while, they were kind of saying um, it was Charles II and that the artist was a guy called Robert Hunter. Uh, and yeah, it, from 1881 onwards then, the, the diary's name, the guy called Lely as the artist. Um, so we actually didn't know for ages and ages and ages that yeah. this was um, George Villiers. He was the first Duke of Buckingham. Uh, mm. And now, Lord Mayor, there are two interesting things about this, certainly from the, from the arts point of view. 
Um, one of our previous guests, Mary McGrath, uh, conserved the canvas of that back in 1989, I think it was, 87. And a lot of people will know uh, Mary from, from, from this particular show. Um, but the other thing that you mentioned about this is something to do with his leg. Can you explain that to us, please? Well, it's now it's only quarter to eleven in the morning, Alan. It uh, doesn't matter. We can we so, can edit it later if we have to. Yeah, I joke, I joke, I joke. <laughs> so, um, he was the first Duke of Buckingham, kind of the late fifteen nineties to the early sixteen hundreds. And if we have a look at him there, in the sixteen hundreds, leather was really, really hard. Um. So he, they used to go around with one boot kind of pulled down. So you can see his left leg, the boot was pulled down a lot mm. on the leather there. And that was to get onto the horse. And that's where the expression to get your leg over came from. Well, that's new to me. <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Now, so, yep. yeah, we're looking. I suppose what's what's important here is when we look at Granville and, and and where he was, again, a Lord Lieutenant at the time, okay? So mm. it was George New, Nugent Temple Granville. Um, the Order of the Knight of St. Patrick was basically his doing. He put that together in terms of, of, of where you went. He has a big statue in St. Patrick's Cathedral. But what he's really, really known for, I don't know if any of your guests have gone to Dublin Castle, but... Um, the, he brought over Vincent uh, Waldra to decorate St. Patrick's Hall and the ceiling in, in Dublin Castle. So that's his contribution to life as Lord Lieutenant. So the Order of St. Patrick in terms of chivalry, but also, yes, yeah, St. Patrick's Hall in Dublin Castle and the ceilings and stuff like that. All that work was done by himself and funded by himself. Very, very impressive painting, too. All right, now this is not... A, a work of art per se, but it is a, a table that has a historic uh, relevance. Absolutely. And Alan, there would be some people that would go ballistic that you call it Michael Collins's table. Um, and the reason <laughs> I say this is, so where we're looking here, guys, is the dining room of the mansion house. So as I said already, the first, the second and the third doll took place in the round room and in the oak room. What we have here is the first cabinet table of the Irish Republic. <laughs> So not alone did Michael Collins sit there, but so did Eamon de Valera, um, so did Cahill Brewer, so did um, the Cosgraves, the Fitzgeralds. Everybody sat around this table. And this is where we spoke about building our republic. This is where um, big decisions were made in terms of the war of independence. So yeah, what we have here in the mansion house is the first cabinet room of the Irish Republic. It's the same table, the same chairs um, that the guys sit in. And for mm -hmm. fans of Michael Collins, the movie with Liam Neeson, you'll see that this was shot in this room as well. There's an awful lot of stuff of sitting around the table and things like that. So maybe next time you look at the movie, you'll be able to say, oh, that was the mansion house. Yeah, my, my, my wife was particularly happy about that. And then the last one we're going to look at is a portrait of Anne Staunton. And this comes back to, we spoke about Michael Staunton a couple of paintings ago. That's right. And the reason we talk about Anne Staunton is, so the story went, as I said, they fled to Australia. And in 1939, their great granddaughter, uh, Carmen Sweetman, got in touch with the mansion house and said, hey, I've got two portraits of um, my great granddad and my great granny, who was Lord Mayor of Dublin in 1847. And I'd like to donate them and give them back to the, uh, to the Dublin City Civic Collection. And they hang in the mansion house. Not because of Michael Staunton, but Lady Anne Staunton. Um, it's the only portrait of a woman that hangs in the mansion house. My God. It's the only portrait in the collection that we have of a Lady Mayoress. Mm. So none of the Lord Mayors were women, um, but it's the only portrait that we have of a Lady Mayoress. And that's Lady Anne Staunton. Um, her, her maiden name was Overend. But yeah, so we, we talk about Anne Staunton a lot because... They're small portraits. They sit just above the door in the dining room, etc. And mm. yeah, it's not about 1847. It's not about Black 47 with Michael. It's all about the fact that Anne is the only portrait of a woman that hangs in the mansion house. Now, we do have photography of later Lord Mayors. There's been 11 female Lord Mayors, etc. But this is the only portrait that exists um, from that time. And that's why that hangs in the mansion house. Yeah. I mean, it seems to be a tradition that's lost, um, you know, in favour of photography. And um, maybe maybe you'll reinstate uh, employing a few portrait artists to That's paint it. your portrait and those succeeding you. 
Alan, and wouldn't that be great? And then the yeah. first thing would be a big freedom of information request to say, how much did that cost? <laughs> okay, well, you know. <laughs> um, right, listen, thank you so much for that. that. That's great. I'm just looking through some, just some co comments that have been made. Uh, Nicola says, very impressed with your art history knowledge. So interesting to hear all about it. Absolutely. And I mean, that's why we're delighted to have you on. You're so knowledgeable, Dahi, and talk in such an engaging way about the history and the paintings. Thank you. Amazing collection of paintings, says Margie Dunn. Yeah, anyway, look, I, th I think there, there's a new um, challenge for you now, Lord Mayor, is to, to em employ some portrait painters and get back to doing some decent portraits. Anyway, um, OK, listen, I've opened it up to the floor. W would anyone like to ask a question or make a comment? I, I'll chip in, if I may. Sure, uh, David, yeah. As usual, um, quick to jump in. Lord yeah. Mayor, one, wonderful presentation, really impressive. And I'm delighted to say that I've met you on two occasions, but you won't remember me at all um, when you opened the Dublin Painting and Sketching Club exhibition and also their celebration of 150 years in the, in the Oak Room. I was present for both of those. Uh, so I know your father was, was a, my, a Lord my Mayor. Father, my father yeah. was Lord Mayor, and my mother, Lord, Lady Mayoress of Cork, in 1977. He was a Fianna Fáil Lord Mayor, and uh, I've written it up on a book called Gerald and Sheila Goldberg of Cork, uh, published last year. He he did a, a lot of research on, on the chain of office that he wore, and he called it the chain of St. Sulpicius, and uh, it's the chain of S, and I think yours is also the same. I'm just wondering... Is yours the chain of some suspicious? So we call it the color of the SS. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's that idea of these kind of dragons form an S as they go through it. So um, if you bear me two seconds, guys, all right, just bear me. David, I can yeah. still hear you. Apologies. It just took me a second to um, go to the safe. So, yeah. so I have the chain here, okay? So you might be able to see on the front of it, there's William of Orange, uh, mm -hmm. or King Billy, as he was known. You've a portcullis there, and then you've Tudor roses as it goes through, and then that's the S in terms of. I don't know if I can get the definition. For yes, you. that's good. You can kind of see it. Then you've got the knots, and then you've got the Leinster harps or the Irish harps, whichever way you want to call it. Yeah. But that's the chain in terms. It's very similar to the Lord Mayor of Cork. Yeah, it's actually it is similar, but there are differences. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay, thanks for that, David. Anybody yeah. else like to ask a question? If I don't know the answer, I'll make it up. It's okay. Yeah, That's he's okay. good. He's good. <laughs> okay. Any, anyone else? Yes, Maria. Yes. Hello, Alan. Um, um, Mr. L Lord Mayor, uh, hello from Rome. I am uh, delighted uh, to listen to you. Thank you for your uh, wonderful talk about art and history. Um, my husband and I had the great uh, opportunity to live in Ireland for four years and a half, and also the opportunity to visit the mansion house and Dublin Castle. And it was really a lovely time. Thank you. Yeah. In, in, in fact, M M Maria's husband was the um, ambassador, the Italian ambassador to Ireland during that period. And that's how Marie and I met at, at a function yeah. mm -hmm. in, in their beautiful house in Lucan. Mm -hmm. uh, Alan, so the can... question has come in, is the chain really heavy from Yvonne there? Yes. Yvonne, so as I said already, we've got two chains. Um, one goes back to 1698 and the other is about 100 years old. The 1698 one's about 4 million euros and it weighs about four and a half, five kilos. So it is Ooh. quite significant. The yeah. night you get elected, when they put the chain over you, your shoulders literally go, whoa, you're not expecting that kind of weight. And this one is fairly significant, but not as heavy. Okay. Very good. Um, Brenda Moore McCann says, thank you for such an enthusiastic and knowledgeable tour. Stephanie, thank you uh, for a very interesting presentation. And I think that's it. Any, anybody else, any comments, questions before we wrap? No? Mary has a hand up. Yay. I mean, yeah, there you are. I know, Mayor. I uh, loved uh, that talk. It was excellent. So I'm just curious. You obviously studied art history. No. Um, you never studied. And where you, you're not you studied history. I studied history. I studied political yeah. history. I heard art, you say history, yeah. History. And 
my background to this kind of comes, I read a lot of books before I became Lord Mayor. I knew I'd be doing tours of the mansion house. And I didn't want to be in the position of going, oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Did so I did a bit of, yeah, that's exactly it. Did a bit of homework. And and then you pick up bits and pieces as you meet different people and you kind of feed them in when you give them tours of the house and things like that. That's fantastic. And I love the way you introduced that woman, the only woman that's hanging there. I mean, that's such an important statement to make to our, you know, to let the people know, because I wouldn't have known that actually either. So, yeah, excellent, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, Mary. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Anybody else? Just a quick, Alan, can you yes, hear me? I can. Uh, just to say that he should get his portrait done and you're the perfect person to do it. I'll stop. Now, come on. No, no, no you're brilliant. There, there, are, there are those. It would be lovely to see it, it, yeah, it, it come up again, all the portraits. It would be great. Yeah, it would be nice, actually, yeah. And sorry, thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. That was an amazing. I just stuck to my chair here. I didn't move a muscle. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Carol. Martina Halpin says, that was a wonderful tour of the Mansion House collection. Thank you so much. I believe during the Irish Georgian period, Dublin was regarded as being relatively permissive compared to the more socially constrained scene in London. George IV's visit to Ireland could probably be the blow blowout of all time. <laughs> probably. Nicola, very interesting and, and loving your enthusiasm for the subject. Yes, that really shows through. Margie, many thanks for a wonderful tour. Thanks, Margie. Right, I think that's probably it, Lord Mayor. So, um, listen, thank you so much. Um, uh, it, it was just a fantastic uh, presentation. And thank you so much for your time um, and knowledge and enthusiasm. Um, and and we, we really do appreciate it. I think this is one for the annals, definitely. Guys, thank you very much for suffering through me for the past hour or so. It's been a pleasure to talk about some of the guys, the, 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 the goodies in the mansion house and you know this is the people's house and if anybody ever wants a tour or to come up or anything whether i'm in office or not please just get in touch with lord mayor at dublincity.ie we're generally very good at facilitating as much access as we possibly can all right brilliant okay thank, thank you for joining us take care yes, bye bye now bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.